You know, the last person who remembers that you ever lived, when that person died, then essentially you, you never existed uh, because there's no one to take the water of your memory with it. I learned from my great uncle um, the qualities of being a human being, uh, of being a man. I was trying to make a decision about my life and what I was going to do, uh, my second major in college because I flunked out of my first. And I was out in the cornfield with him as he was pulling corn for dinner for Aunt Shook. So I was telling him my predicament and saying I got to figure out what to do. And he finally said to me, he said, well, Chester, he says, whatever you decide to do, uh, he says it's very important to make a mark on life, as he pulled the shuckle or ear of corn, or else you could very well die undeclared. It really focused me. It's a statement that is haunting. It haunts you every day, every year. It's not something you can really let go of because the, the, uh, the truth of it. I realized while I was at Tuskegee that two of the people who I love so much in my life, my great uncle and my great aunt, uh, at home I had never seen a picture of. And it made me want to have a picture of them. But I didn't, as a student, I didn't have the money to hire a photographer to go 100 miles south and make these pictures. So I asked this photographer if he would teach me. After a year of learning and saving money to get one camera and then a better camera, I then went home to start making pictures of my great aunts, my great uncles, and um, then people my age. But my real interest was my great aunts and my great uncles. I marched uh, from Tuskegee. We were from time to time go to Montgomery, the state capital. We had a governor at that time named George Wallace. And George Wallace was very anti-black people. And he made no bones about it. And he you know, believed that segregation was right and it was, uh, will remain forever. And then I noticed, it, it came upon me that after looking at the newspaper mag and the television, that after we marched, uh, the image of us, uh, we were not portrayed as American citizens petitioning the government. The photographers and the slant of the story rather portrayed us essentially as uh, thugs or hooligans. And it, for the first time, made me realize the power of the camera. Uh, because my interest with the camera was to make messages of the heart. And now I begin to realize how <clears throat> Other people saw us. So I thought that, wow, maybe my camera could have an effect. Maybe if I can make photographs from the inside, showing people as we are, that can make a difference. So that's what I tried to do. And, that's what, and that became my role then and in the, uh, the civil rights movement to document it. Don't have a favorite picture, if that's your question. And I learned from Romy Bearden that, you know, if you, once you have a favorite picture, then what's the use of keep working? Um, you might as well die. So my favorite, I learned to realize that my favorite image is always the next one. I guess I like to see what's extraordinary and ordinary, and I like to pay attention to things that a lot of people would, you know, wouldn't think twice of when you pass. Um, because for me, um, it's the glue of humanity, the ordinary moments that we do every day, the getting from A to, to B, uh, and the feelings from A to B, and then simply breathing. It's um, the human experience. It's the, uh, the effect that we have on each other, the effect that we have on our environment. Uh, and those effects do not have to be monumental. Uh, to make a statement about humanity. My wife and my son and I was, was, we were coming down the steps one day and I saw this family approaching, this woman in her white. She looked incredible. It was just a whole aura to her. And I asked if I could make a picture of the whole family and I set up a stool real quick outside and I made that picture. 
And it's become a picture that really is an icon, that people, this is my one signature image um, of this woman. And what made the picture, though, is her eyes, and it's the soul in her eyes, and in her spirit. I do believe that the eye is the uh, windows to the soul. And this woman had a certain spirit to her. And being able to capture that spirit, all of that together, is what makes that image so unique. But that's, you know, the power of the eye. The eye is the most sacred thing, and the eye reveals the soul. And I would say that, you know, part of um, my approach with when I'm looking at eyes is that I see myself as a diver. You know, the eye is much like a, a pool, and you're diving off into the eye, into the soul, into the spirit, so that you get, uh, you get layers and layers, you get textures and textures of the person, the moment, the place. Your ability to capture, capture people and to understand people is in direct proportion to your ability to understand yourself. So the deeper you go into yourself or you understand yourself, no matter whatever year you're in in your life uh, or because of experiences your friends or your parents went through, the deeper you force yourself into understanding yourself, uh, the easier it is to understand other people, to empathize with other people. Uh, but understanding yourself is not a necessarily an easy thing. And most people tend to be very social and want to be friends and want to be extroverted and external. And I think for a lot of people, the, the moment that they really try to avoid is being alone with themselves. But only by being alone with yourself can you really understand yourself. And the more you do that, then the more you're able to embrace and understand everybody else. We live in a society where until recently, um, um, you know, people really felt, um, feel a sense of self-negation because you're an African person, African descent, and self-hate is, is, is all still too rampant. Uh, and I guess I like to think that one of my missions for my work is as long as we have self-hate, then there's a need for the mind counter images that show that, hey, there are, there are things that, about yourself that you can feel good about, you can feel proud about, and that you should aspire to. You know, we all have histories that we're not very proud of. So, you know, you cannot be uh, imprisoned by your past unless you choose to be. Because out of those questions, out of that turmoil, of trying to uh, put that together, uh, you then discover a lot more about yourself and a lot more about African possibility, human possibility. And if I can do, if my work can do anything to help encourage people that way, then, then you know, that's my mark. As you know, my great uncle Phil said, you know, it's important to make a mark on life or else you can die undeclared. So if my mark is to spark, you know, curiosity in some kid who later become whatever they want to become, then, you know, that's my mark. I'm proud of that mark. Life is precious. Every moment is precious. And I guess for me, uh, I'm well aware uh, I accept death so that I know there are moments, you know, life is like a book. And each moment, each day, each month is like a page. And at some time, at some point, the pages will run out. But in between those covers, <laughs> that's a lot of exciting stuff will happen.